Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. for today's episode because it includes another author interview. I am really, really enjoying these author interviews, getting to read books that I might not have otherwise and getting to speak with authors who are all wonderful and fascinating in their own ways. We're getting a variety of genres and a variety of different types of books and I have really, really enjoyed it and I hope you have as well. So today we are going to be speaking in a few moments with author Curtis C. Chen. He has written two books. The first one is called Waypoint Kangaroo, and the second one is Kangaroo 2. They are part of a series. Kangaroo 2 comes out next week on Tuesday, June 20th, and these are science fiction books. They are set in space, and I'm going to be honest with you. I love science fiction. I watch science fiction. I grew up watching Star Trek with my dad. I grew up watching and loving Star Wars. I watched a bunch of other science fiction movies and TV shows, but whenever I would try to read science fiction, I just couldn't manage to get into it. There was something about well, okay, there was something about all the science that I couldn't quite ever read through and figure out. And so eventually I just gave up. I mean, I love the space stories. I love the the kind of otherworldliness of science fiction. You know, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to fantasy, but you don't have to understand magic, right? I felt like I had to pay way too much attention to the science portion of science fiction, and science was not my strong suit in high school. I was okay at it. I didn't get terrible grades in it or anything, but uh, not my best subject. So eventually, I gave up on science fiction. So when I agreed to do, or when I set up this interview with Curtis Chen, I knew I was going to read science fiction, and I was both excited and a little bit terrified because I had to go back into this genre that I'd been avoiding for so long. And I'm so glad that I was able to do this interview because these books are wonderful. Yes, it's science fiction. Yes, there are a few things that I didn't necessarily understand, but one of the things that we talk about in the interview is that there's a few things in this world that he has created that no one really understands. So you don't feel so bad when you don't understand exactly how something works in this world. I love this because the books are adventures. They uh, involve a main character named Kangaroo who is a secret agent. He is not a great secret agent. He's not terrible, but he's, he, you know, he gets himself into situations that he doesn't always extricate himself from so effectively. He is a little bit sarcastic. He is a little bit snarky. He's very human, which I appreciate. He doesn't always do everything right, but he always tries to do the right thing according to his code of ethics, and he is a delightful character. These books are really, really wonderful. As I said, the first one is Waypoint Kangaroo, and it is out. You can read it already. And then Kangaroo 2 comes out next Tuesday, uh, June 20th, so I highly recommend. You don't have to read Kangaroo Waypoint Kangaroo first. They are designed, as Mr. Chen will say in the interview, to be fairly, you know, you can read them. You don't have to read them in order. You can pick up the story pretty well without reading them in order, but they're both very good. So if you want to read them in order and you've got a week to read the first one before you go pick up the second one next Tuesday. So let me give you the blurb about Kangaroo 2. This is from the description on Amazon. It says, set in the same world as Waypoint Kangaroo, Curtis C. Chen's Kangaroo 2 is bursting with adrenaline and intrigue in this unique outer space adventure. 
On the way home from his latest mission, secret agent Kangaroo's spacecraft is wrecked by a rogue mining robot. The agency tracks the bot back to the moon, where a retired asteroid miner, codenamed Clementine, might have information about who's behind the sabotage. Clementine will only deal with Jessica Chu, Kangaroo's personal physician and former military doctor once deployed in the asteroid belt. Kangaroo accompanies Jessica as a courier, smuggling Clementine's payment of solid gold in the pocket universe that only he can use. What should be a simple infiltration is hindered by the nearly one million tourists celebrating the anniversary of the first moon landing. And before Kangaroo and Jessica can make contact, lunar authorities arrest Jessica for the murder of a local worker. Jessica won't explain why she met the victim in secret or erased security footage that could exonerate her. To make things worse, a sudden terror attack puts the whole moon under lockdown. Now Kangaroo alone has to get Clementine to talk, clear Jessica's name, and stop a crooked scheme which threatens to ruin approximately one million vacations. But old secrets are buried on the moon, and digging up the past will make Kangaroo's future very complicated. See, even just the uh, the explanation, the blurb uh, of the book makes me, uh, hopefully you, want to read it. It's fun. It's, you know, it's a little bit of secret agent. It's a little bit of science fiction. There's a little bit of mystery involved. He has to, Kangaroo has to solve the problems that happen in the book and figure out what is going on. It, they're wonderful. I loved them. I highly recommend them. I'm going to stop babbling about them now because I would much rather you listen to Curtis Chen talk about his work than listen to me sort of babble on about how much I loved them, but I did love them. So without further ado, let's turn now to our inter my interview with author Curtis C. Chen, who joined me via Skype from his home in Portland. Hi, Curtis. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? Good. Thanks for inviting me, Sarah. You're welcome. We are here today to talk about your new book that's coming out, Kangaroo 2. But before we talk about the book, I would love for my listeners to just get to know you a little bit. Um, so whatever you feel comfortable sharing about yourself, we'd love to hear. Okay, sure. I So I'm Curtis Chen. I, uh, I'm living in the Portland, Oregon area right now. Uh, I used to be a software engineer, and now I'm a freelance writer. Uh, and this is my second novel. Um, most of my other free time, other than writing, um, is spent organizing Puzzle Pind, which is a monthly event that happens in bars uh, around the world now. So yeah, um, okay. that's, that's basically me <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> Yeah, okay. it's mostly fiction writing right now, which is, uh, yeah, I'm really happy that that's sort of taking off and uh, I'm able to do that. Yeah. Uh, so when did you begin writing? Is it something that you've always wanted to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, I started, I was always interested in, you know, stories from a very young age. Um, I started reading pretty early. Uh, my parents uh, would read to me. Uh, my mother was a public librarian for most of her career. So um, she was always, you know, very much into uh, my sister and me reading, and uh, she would bring books home for us that she thought we would like. Um, so from a very young age, uh, probably sometime in grade school, I started thinking about writing my own stories. And, you know, wasn't very good at it at first, but, you know, kept at it, and uh, eventually it, uh, it started working out. Uh, my first short fiction uh, was published in 2006, uh, and then the first novel came out uh, last year, 2016. Mm -hmm. In, in in terms of genres, have you always been interested in more of the science fiction, or did you like uh, you know did you write in other genres before? Yeah, it's always been science fiction, fantasy, pretty much. Um, I was uh, I was very much into science fiction from a very young age. Uh, the first one of the first TV shows I ever saw was Star Trek, and. Uh, the first movie I ever saw in the theater was Star Wars, so uh, that was a pretty strong influence <laughs> from the very start. Uh, and then I got into you know science fiction books. Uh, I was really into Asimov's robot stories for a long time. Um, and then as I started reading more, you know, I found you know other other authors, other genres. Um, yeah, so lately I've been getting into more fantasy, um, so that's been really cool too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also a little bit of a mystery element to the kangaroo books because he's, you know, 
uh, he's not a detective, but he does some detective <laughs> work. Uh, is that a genre you were also interested in? Uh, I mean, I've read stuff in the genre. It was, I've never had a huge interest in it, but um, I mean, a lot of stories have mystery elements, you know, as you pointed out. And uh, certainly um, there was a, a period in high school when I was very much into uh, spy fiction. Um, and that can have sort of the mystery element because you don't know, you know, who's working for who sometimes. Um, there are a lot of secrets and, you know, people are lying to each other about things. Um, but I, I also, I do remember, you know, in, in high school, the theater company at my high school would do um, plays and a couple of those plays were things like Agatha Christie's The Mousetrap and uh, you know so then you know I started looking at those too so that was always it was interesting in a different way because um, mysteries are sort of um, more puzzly in that way where you know the reader can kind of try to figure out what's happening as the story goes along um, and I understand that's uh, you know, changing recently because I've, I've read some analyses of how the mystery genre has changed and you know diversified and now there are all these different kinds of mysteries um but one thing is that readers have become um so savvy about you know you read a mystery and the author puts clues in there but they don't want to give away the ending but they want to give away enough that you can maybe figure it out um that wasn't really an issue for me because i i never really uh wanted people to know everything um and because kangaroo is all first person um it was sort of easier to hide things from from that character that he wouldn't possibly know or wouldn't be able to reason out um, over the course of the story tell us a little bit about kangaroo some of my listeners will have read the first book uh some of them won't so just tell us a little bit about uh kangaroo as a character Okay, sure. So Kangaroo is a, he's a spy and you know, he's in the future. So there's spaceships and things. Uh, and he also has, Kangaroo is his code name because he has the ability to open a portal into an empty parallel universe, a pocket universe, where he can hide anything. Uh, the catch is that uh, inside the pocket, it looks like deep space. So there's no air, no light, no heat. So, you know, things will freeze eventually if you leave them in there too long. Uh, if you put a person in there, they should really be in a spacesuit if you want them to survive <laughs> for more than a few minutes. Um, but that's the reason he was recruited to be a spy, because he can basically smuggle anything anywhere. Uh, as long as he can fit it through, you know, the portal that he opens into the pocket. Um, but otherwise, he's not that interested in all the other spy stuff, like doing all the training or learning about, you know, weapons or whatever. You know, he gets to, you know, go to space and other planets and, you know, see cool things uh, and then just has to sort of, you know, carry stuff with him. Um, so there's this, so I wanted, uh, I wanted to sort of have fun with the character in that way where, you know, he's the only one who can do this. Like no one else in the world has, you know, this ability or anything like it. But uh, I wanted him not to be totally dedicated to that job, even though it's kind of the only thing he's been able to do because he was recruited at a, a very young age. So he's kind of grown up inside the agency, this spy agency, and doesn't really know any other well, there's a lot of backstory there, but <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to keep this short. Um, but, no, you're doing great. Yeah, so, so, so I wanted him to be a little snarky, a little sarcastic, because he knows he's special and he can get away with things. Um, but at the end of the day, like he is sort of still beholden to these people who really control his life in a lot of ways. And I'm so sorry to interrupt, but you know, I do have to interrupt every once in a while and go to a commercial break. So we're about to take the first break of the... And when we come back, we'll be talking more with Curtis C. Chen about the character of Kangaroo, his inspiration for the story, etc. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well... Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships.
Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. We are talking today with author Curtis C. Chen about his Kangaroo series. And he's going to talk more about Kangaroo as a character, about his inspiration for the story, about his inspiration for some of the elements of the story. So let's get back to that interview. What was your inspiration for this character and his story? Uh, so the character in particular uh, probably came from a lot of different things that I've read or shows that I've seen. Um, just sort of, I wanted him to be kind of a younger character who was not, you know, no, not, not necessarily as cynical as some, you know, th there's a lot of spy stories out there. And I kind of had that in mind that I wanted to not do the same kinds of things uh, exactly that have been done before. And also to subvert some of the uh, tropes of that genre, uh, especially all the the James Bond stuff, where you know the main character is you know hyper competent at a lot of stuff and very confident in his own abilities. Um, and I wanted Kangaroo to be a different kind of kind of person than that. Um, the the pocket in particular um, that came from actually the original idea came from a, a, a comic uh, cartoon that I read when I was very, very young. Um, it's something out of Japan called Doraemon. Um, and in, it had been translated in Chinese. Um, so I was, I was born in Taiwan and I lived there for the first uh, five years of my life. Uh, and uh, my grandfather owned the bookshop for, for a while. So um, I read a bunch of these comics um, and in Taiwan it was called Xiao Ding Dang. And uh, the, and that the, the character is a robot cat from the future. Um, That's who comes, awesome. <laughs> who comes back in time to help the like the grandfather of his owner in the future because he's kind of this you know dorky kid who's bad at school and needs help with a lot of things. Um, uh, but so the so Doraemon has this. Um, I believe the the canonical English translation is a fourth dimensional gadget pocket uh, is literally a pouch like on his abdomen like you know a you know a marsupial animal mm -hmm. would have and he pulls stuff out of it and uh and so in the cartoon it's sort of um very loose in terms of the physics of uh i mean there's time travel already but you know in terms of like he can pull anything of any size out of the pocket and mm -hmm. it just ext expands to its normal size once he gets it out of there um and for Kangaroo, when I was thinking about, okay, how would this, how might this actually work in a more realistic setting um, for, you know, a, an adult novel, um, I spent a bunch of time thinking about the physics of how that could work. Um, so, like, what does the portal look like? You know, what are the limitations on how Kangaroo can use it? Um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it was a big, you know, mix of ideas and uh, sort of came together after a while. Okay. Is there anything you would consider to be autobiographical in the series, either in the series or in terms of Kangaroo himself? Uh, nothing specifically autobiographical. I mean, I think a lot of the, the dialogue is just sort of naturally how I talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, although I, I did, you know, make an effort to you know, make different characters sound different um, so that, you know, they're not all the same person kind of thing. Um, in, well, there, there's one thing that I sort of snuck in, uh, to Kangaroo's character, which is that he, um, he grew up watching all these 20th century, uh, TV shows and movies, um, right. for reasons that aren't really important to the story, but it was sort of a, a way for me to be able to make jokes that, you know, the readers now are going to understand, even though they're not necessarily going to make sense in the future. Um, but then that also gave me a, another opportunity to, for a kangaroo to, you know, be funny in that he makes all these jokes that no one else gets <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he then has to explain them, which <laughs> makes it even worse. So, yeah. yeah. So that was fun to play with too. <laughs> yeah. I love that about his character. He's, he, He's funny, just no one really finds him funny because they don't quite understand him. Right, exactly. Which makes him funnier to the reader. <laughs> yeah, because I think we've all been there. It's like, what, oh, you, yeah. you don't know this? Like, no, it's great. Let me explain it to you. Well, no, no, that doesn't help. Sorry. Right, right. That just makes it worse. <laughs>
All right. So the second book is coming out next week, which yep. is really exciting. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Tell us a little bit about the second book. Um, whatever you want to say, you know, in terms of you don't want to give too much away, but how it how it's different from the first book, you know, just whatever you want to tell us about that second book. Yeah. So Kangaroo 2 is the second book. It's spelled T-O-O um, mm -hmm. for reasons that will become clear as you read it. Um, it is a little different than the first one. Um, and one of the things I was able to do, uh, so, so with the first book, like it was my, my first novel that got published. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I did a lot of work on it over the years and learned a lot of things along the way. And one of the things I started out with was um, like I when I started writing that story, I very uh, on purpose decided to limit the the setting. So it mostly takes place on this one like, spaceship. It's a big mm -hmm. ship, but like it's one sort of uh, one limited um, location. And in the second book, um, I wanted to stretch a little bit more. So it, it takes place in more different kinds of places. Um, it's on the moon. That's not really a spoiler. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and people do sort of travel around the moon because it's, uh, it's in the future. So it's been colonized and there are people living there, working there, um, a lot of tourists, uh, because, you know, it's the moon. So, you know, there's all the Apollo landing sites and the historical space stuff, uh, museums now. Um, so, so that was kind of fun to play, play around with, you know, a wider, uh, geography and to think about, okay, so what is going to be on the moon in this future? What are things that, you know, would be interesting for him to go look at or what are things that could go wrong in all these different places. And the, the series does take place at sort of an undetermined distance in the future. How much, before you started, how much um, world building had you done? So how much did you know about this, this future universe before you started? Yeah, I thought a, a fair amount about that. Um, I sort of deliberately don't specify what year it is in either book. Um, although I, I have an idea, um, sort of in, in my own head, um, for various reasons. Um, because I wanted, like everyone has different ideas about the future, right? And like, you know, how long it's gonna, you know, take us to get to Mars or whatever, or, you know, start, you know, mining asteroids for whatever. Um, so I didn't want to, I didn't want that to be something that would throw a reader out of the story and like, oh, that's, you know, way too soon or like, oh, that's way too far in the future. We'd have much more advanced technology than this then. So I'm like, you know, you can imagine whatever you want. Um, and that's fine. It doesn't really matter to the story. It just matters that, you know, it is, you know, a decent amount of time from now. Um, and I, and I did have specific levels about, uh, specific ideas about the level of technology I wanted. Like I didn't want, um, even though I love Star Trek, uh, I didn't want it to be that far out where a lot of the, the technology is almost magical. You know, just sort of, you know, press a button and, you know, lots of things will happen. Like right. I wanted, uh, especially in the first book, I wanted there to be things that would go wrong and it would be very, very difficult to fix. Um, and th I think that, probably comes a lot from uh having been an engineer for for a long a long time um i was in software but like i you know knew people who worked in hardware and hear about their problems and knew about my own problems you know with computers so i did want to have that kind of feel and uh and hopefully that that makes it a little more grounded uh science fiction and makes it something that readers now can relate to more because you know we all have problems with you know computers and you know, machines and our cars and whatever so i did want there to be more advanced technology but i didn't want it to be magical and i wanted it to fail for very specific reasons and then have to get fixed by the characters in the story you know in certain ways that would seem you know plausible and and was something that you know people reading it now would understand like, okay, I don't know exactly how that works, but I, mm -hmm. I can understand how something like that might work. Like the, this technology doesn't exist yet, but you know, it feels right in terms of how everything fits together. Did you do a lot of research in terms of the science part of the science fiction? 
Um, on some things, yes. Um, I definitely, uh, for the first book, I you know had to do, do some math on you know how long it might take to get from Earth to Mars and mm-hmm. how orbits work and all that. Even though I do have you know kind of magical like engine that will make your ship go really really fast Mm -hmm. Um, and i kind of hand wave like how that works um and in in book two um i actually did a bunch of research on like how far apart things are on the moon and like how long it might take to get there given what kind of transportation you have and uh so there's sort of you know time issues there too um and then uh in the first book, there's also um, I, I don't have anything going faster than light in in this in this world, so so people are still dealing with uh, things that you know that NASA deals with right now. Like you know, they send a space probe out to Mars or out to Saturn. Like there's a time delay for the signal to get back here, so right. you can't really remote control things in real time like it's going to take hours for something to get out you know to to jupiter or saturn and then more hours for it to come back Mm -hmm. um so i i I still have those kinds of issues um and you know when he's on the moon it's not really you know a long delay but when they were going to mars like there were there was a several minutes delay and that was one thing uh, that worked in the story to sort of isolate the people on that ship even more like even if they can communicate there's this big time delay Mm -hmm. so that's always an issue yeah and then other stuff i just made up (laughs) to be honest (laughs) like the the pocket is uh like how does that work i I don't really know like and and kangaroo doesn't really know either Mm -hmm. which lets me get away with that but uh, i do have some like stuff that's not in the book that i've sort of worked out um in my notes uh, or you know how this might be explained by, you know, different kinds of, you know, quantum string theory or whatever. But uh, it's something that I don't expect to get into um, in the books very much. I like how in the second book they um, they just they tell him that his brain is weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. They don't really understand how the pocket works, but his brain is weird. <laughs> Yeah, right. So that's sort of a background issue throughout all the books. Like, he's the only one who can do this, and they don't know how he does it. So he is important. Like, they want to keep him alive. But they're also, like, always running tests on him when he's not out on the missions. Like, how how can we uh, reproduce this in some way? Mm-hmm. So that's sort of, uh, yeah, that's sort of a, a background uh, running through uh, through all the stories. I'm going to interrupt one more time so we can take our second break of the podcast. But when we come back, we'll be talking more about, of course, Kangaroo. What's next for Kangaroo? What's next for Curtis C. Chen? So stay tuned and we will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. We are about to wrap up my interview with author Curtis C. Chen regarding his Kangaroo series and his new book coming out next week called Kangaroo 2. So let's get back to that interview. And I know you just finished the second book and that it's just coming out, but what mm-hmm. is next for Kangaroo? Uh, for Kangaroo, uh, that's that's a good question. <laughs> um, we, we don't have a, a third book plan right now okay. I, I have ideas for that 
Um, I'm actually I'm working on a standalone novel right now. Um, mm-hmm. We just uh, sent a proposal for that to one editor, and we're gonna see how that goes. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely have ideas for where Kangaroo could go next. Um, I would love to send him to other planets, um, and you know. Um, so I think the the theme is kind of going to be um, space tourism in a way because mm-hmm. he's going to all these places and uh, in my mind like th- this is something that I've thought about for a few years um, is that you know people want to go do things and see things for fun a lot so you know once we have space travel that's you know fairly easy and affordable and people can fly around the solar system when they won't what are they going to want to do? Well, they're going to want to like go to the moon and look around, go to Mars. Um, so the idea I've, I've been thinking about for you know a future book is going to Venus. Um, and there's actually uh, so NASA has um, a group that thinks about very very advanced uh, future projects that they might do. Um, and they have uh, a video. I think it's on YouTube, and you can find it if you search for like NASA Venus. Um, uh, balloons maybe but th- they actually have this idea f- f- where you know on uh, venus has a it's a pretty uh, toxic and inhospitable environment um below the cloud cover like there, there are clouds all over venus and it's uh, you know there's acid rain below there and all this kind of bad stuff but above the clouds like it's very sunny and um like you you still can't breathe the air right it's not it's not good for humans but you could actually like float balloons above the clouds so it's not raining acid rain on you and you know kind of hang out there and it's you know it's it's always sunny on venus <laughs> <laughs> you can sort of travel around so they actually have this video where they they have a computer animation of like how this might work where they would send these basically airships you know, over out to venus and have people just kind of tooling around above the clouds and you can like drop probes down to look at stuff but you're safe up here and you you'd still need your own you know breathable air you know oxygen and all that but like that is you know as far as we know like that is a thing you could actually do you could have these airships like flying around so you know have people who could go there and be tourists um, and just, you know, hang out uh, on Venus and sunbathe and, you know, look at whatever. Um, I, I feel like that's that's a thing that might happen. I can only imagine what kangaroo will get himself into <laughs> if he goes. <laughs> yeah, so, like, yeah, so that's the second part of it, right? And that's kind of what I did with uh, book two also, where um, this is also not a huge spoiler, but, you know, he goes mm-hmm. to the moon. And there is a, a retirement community on the moon um, because, you know, the moon has lower gravity. Um, you need to control the climate anyway because you're building these habitats. So, you know, if you're an elderly person um, who maybe doesn't uh, get around too well, well, if you're only in one-sixth the gravity, you might be able to walk without, you know, having a walker or something. Uh, you know, your bones are still going to, you know, lose mass after a few years, but, you know, you're, you're kind of there already. And, you know, meanwhile, you're on the moon. So so that was a good idea I started with. Like, okay, so let's put, you know, this retirement community on the moon. And then how do we get the, the spy stuff mixed up in that? So it was kind of fun to sort of come up with that story. Do you have any idea how many books you might have in the series? Or is that just up in the air right now? I've always thought of it as an open-ended series. Um, and I wanted, uh, ideally, I wanted each book to be pretty much a standalone. So, like, as long as you knew, you know, three or four things about the world, you could pick it up and get into it uh, and not necessarily need all the backstory. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I have ideas about where it could go. Kind of depends on what happens with, with publishing and uh, mm-hmm. me in particular. But, yeah, I, I definitely have ideas for for several more books you know if if someone wants to buy them oh i want to read them not that that's gonna make a difference but i really (laughs) love the first two so i would i would continue reading about kangaroo's adventures in in terms of writing do you keep to a certain schedule do you have a favorite place that you write anything about your writing habits yeah um i think uh, so in general i think writing habits are very personal um and 
everyone kind of has to figure out what works for them. Um, so f for me, um, I don't necessarily have a set time. Um, I find I'm generally better later in the day. I'm not one of one of those morning writers, but I can stay up pretty late and uh, continue to be productive. And, you know, I have an office at home. Um, I also uh, am a member of a, a co-working space locally, so sometimes I'll go, go into town and do that. Um, I have a regular weekly write-in at a, a local pub that has, you know, a lot of tables. Um, and that's a nice way to sort of go and get some work done and also see other people and um, be able to talk to them about writing and, uh, you know, just catch up on things. Because it is very, it can be very solitary um, writing because you are like, you kind of, you have to do it by yourself. You can, you know, get feedback from people at certain points, but mostly it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty lonely job. So I've, I've been working on making more reasons for myself to like get out and see other people and other writers, especially, and just, you know, see what they're working on, how they're dealing with, you know, whatever story issues or business issues uh, are happening in their lives. And, and that's mm -hmm. really good, too. Um, Portland's a really, really good town for, you know, creative people like that. You talked a little bit about um, the reading science fiction as a kid. When you have time to read now, mm -hmm. what are you reading? Uh, it's still mostly science fiction and fantasy. Um, right now I'm reading uh, To Like the Lightning by Ada Palmer which is really, really interesting. What else have I read recently? Um, I've been reading some nonfiction stuff, uh, kind of for research for this uh, book proposal. Um, other science fiction and fantasy, I think. Um, oh, I really loved uh, Michelle Baker's first two books, Borderline and Phantom Pains. Um, and now I'm kind of bummed because i have to wait till next year for the know, third one <laughs> yeah um but those are really good um i would definitely recommend those that's sort of a an urban fantasy thing but yeah the the first one uh, was nominated for a nebula award this year so that's borderline um what else have i read lately um i uh, i tell everyone to go read uh nora jemison's books nk jemison the Hundred Thousand Kingdoms um, is great. That whole series, her current series, uh, is the uh, I believe it's Broken Earth. Uh, the first one was The Fifth Gate, which won the Hugo, and the second one is the Obelisk Gate, which is up for a bunch of awards this year. She's fantastic. Um, pretty much everything she writes is great. Um, yeah, I could go on, but uh, yeah, those are things that have really sort of captured my imagination lately. Yeah, and like I said, I'm, I've been trying to get more into fantasy because I didn't read a lot of that when I was mm -hmm. younger. Um, but, you know, um, now sort of being, being part of the, the community uh, more, um, I really uh, am making an effort to get to know, you know, what's out there, what people are, you know, really into. Oh, Uprooted, Naomi Novik. That's also okay. really good. That won a bunch of awards mm -hmm. last year. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is there... Anything yeah. else that we haven't covered that you'd like people to know about your books? Uh, yes, uh, there is one thing. Um, it's that um, I was able to talk my publisher into hiding a puzzle into the in the book covers. Right, so, I read something about that. Uh, both on, yeah, so both on Waypoint Kangaroo and on Kangaroo 2, um, the cover image... Um, has a little puzzle hidden in it and you can you can see the the images online and just solve it that way uh, and they both lead to um, online things that uh, give you a little bit of a taste of the story um, and they're interactive so um, you know people have enjoyed them and you know they'll they'll be up indefinitely okay. so yeah if you uh, want to check out that they are online uh, waypointkangaroo.com and kangaroo2.com which is the number two just to make things more confusing <laughs> and speaking of online uh, where can people yep. follow you online social media or do you have a, I mean there's obviously those websites but do you have an author website yeah my author website is just curtisccen.com with the middle initial um, 
Uh, I'm on Twitter as Curtis C. Chen, um, and I think the website has links to uh, other stuff, uh, Goodreads, uh, Facebook, all okay. that kind of stuff. Those were my questions. I really enjoyed having you here. Thank you so much again for joining me. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And again, the book comes out on Tuesday, uh, next a week from today, right? Or- yeah, yep. June twentieth, and uh, we're doing a book launch in San Francisco. If people are around there, um, yeah, it'll be at the Bindery, um, which is the Booksmiths' uh, new event space in the Hate. Cool. Are you doing anything in Portland? Uh, yeah, we'll be at Powell's Books at Cedar Hills Crossings on June twenty seventh. Uh, be in Seattle on June twenty ninth at University Bookstore, and then back in San Francisco July 9th which is a Sunday for SF and SF at the American Book Binding Museum uh, and I'm doing all those events with other authors um, because uh, that's been really fun uh, so on the 20th I'll be in San Francisco with Ariel Waldman who is a space science blogger um, I'm doing Portland and Seattle with Jason Huff who's uh, wrote uh, The Darwin Elevator uh, that whole series and uh, Zero World. And on July 9th, I'll be with Megan O'Keefe, who wrote uh, Breaking the Chains. Um, and the third book in that trilogy is is out this year. Fun. It sounds like a lot of you, you've got a lot of good things coming up. You'll be traveling and meeting with great people. So I am. Yeah. And I, I suppose I, I should also mention that uh, I'll be in Seattle on the 24th for the Locus Awards uh, because Waypoint Kangaroo is actually up for uh, the first novel category this year which is really cool. Uh, I don't expect to win at all because the other books in that category are amazing um, but you know it's it really is an honor just to be nominated yeah, and included. That's great. Congratulations. That that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a fun time. That's always a, a fun uh, fun weekend to do. Wonderful. Well, uh, congratulations on the second book. It's great. Uh, everyone should go out and check it out. I mean, they should read. They should read both of them because they're both fun. I loved both of them. So, oh, thank, thank you. you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And um, good luck with all of your, you know, with your with your second book coming out and with all of your events. Okay. Thanks, sir. Once again, I'd like to thank author Curtis C. Chen for joining me today. I really enjoyed speaking with him. I really enjoyed reading these books. I highly recommend them. Even if you're not necessarily a fan of science fiction, they're still a fun adventure. There's still a bit of a mystery. The characters are compelling and a little quirky, which I always like in my characters. So check these out, especially if you love science fiction, definitely check these out. But if you gave up on science fiction like I did, go back with these. Ease your way back into science fiction with the Kangaroo series because they are fabulous and I highly recommend them. So thank you again, uh, Mr. Chen, for joining me and for writing these fabulous books. As always, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can can follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram. I would love to hear what you think of the interviews. I'd love to hear thoughts on who you'd like me to interview next or what books you would like me to talk about next. You can download all of our podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and any of those apps that you use for your mobile devices. I hope you'll join me next week when I will be talking about... Rick Riordan's new series, The Trials of Apollo, and book two of that series just came out in May. It's called The Dark Prophecy, so I hope you'll join me for that. But in the meantime, I really hope you will go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.